Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is David London, and I am the Chief Experience Officer at The Peel. And allow me to welcome you to today's presentation on the architect Harry Benjamin Henry Latrobe with historian, professor, and author Gene Baker. A small group of us had the privilege of attending this event in person last week at Carroll Mansion, and I'm excited to share this presentation with you shortly. Following the pre-recorded lecture, we are also thrilled to have Jean Baker joining us virtually today to continue the conversation, as well as to answer some of your questions. And if all goes as planned, the Q&A will be moderated live from the Latrobe Room at the Peel by our Chief Strategy Officer, Nancy Proctor, as well as the President of the Peel's Board of Directors, William Chick Chickering. Today's event will last approximately one hour and includes ASL interpretation as well as live transcriptions. I would like to thank our interpreter, Jeremy, who you see here beside me, as well as our transcriber, Karen, who is working behind the scenes today. A fully captioned version of the program will be uploaded to YouTube, and a full transcript will also be made available to all those who rsvp to today's event. If you need any help or have any suggestions for accessibility, you can email us at access at thepeelcenter.org. The best way to view this program, along with its accessibility features, is on the Peel's website at www.thepeelcenter.org backslash live. For those of you who are currently watching from the Peel's website, live captions can be uh, seen not only in the YouTube player, but also in the stream text reader located directly beneath the video player. Uh, also on the website, to the left of the video, there is a chat box, which we encourage you to use to leave comments and engage in the conversation, as well as questions. And your questions will be passed to the presenters. We also have some listeners who are joining us by phone today. If you are listening by phone, we ask that you please keep yourself muted. This event is the second of the Peel's experimentation with hybrid events, combining both in-person recordings with a virtual Q&A. While we certainly don't expect any complications, in the event of any technical difficulties or unforeseen circumstances during today's broadcast, please watch the chat box to your left or your email for further instructions. If you need any technical help with today's broadcast, you can email online at thepeelcenter.org. You can also reach us on social media. We are at The Peel on Twitter and Facebook and The Peel Baltimore on Instagram. The Peel is home to the world's largest digital collection of Baltimore stories and is renovating the first museum building in the United States, established by Rembrandt Peel in 1814, to provide a showcase for the city's storytellers, its artists and architects, its griots and historians, and creators and culture keepers of all types. The room that makes the Peel architecturally unique is what is known as the Latrobe Room, which you currently see some images coming up here. With soaring ceilings and a large skylight at its center, the Latrobe Room will host performances, exhibitions, and events that ensure the whole story of the city is told and help people everywhere see Baltimore in a new light. We are nearing the end of renovations for, of the Peel Museum building and now need to purchase a professional lighting system that will shine a light on this brecht breathtaking gallery when it reopens next year. Our goal is to raise $20,000 to illuminate the Latrobe Room. And you'll get a chance to see the Latrobe Room live at the end of this broadcast. And the Peel's board chair, Chick Chickering, will tell you about the exciting opportunity to double your donation to lighting the Latrobe Room. You can visit thepeelcenter.org backslash campaign to learn more. And now we begin this event by acknowledging that the lands where the Peel and Baltimore is situated today are the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Piscataway, Lenape, and the Susquehannock indigenous peoples. The vast coastal area today known as Baltimore City, Maryland, sustained indigenous peoples until the arrival of Europeans beginning in the 1600s. Over the next 400 years, many Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock communities were decimated, absorbed by larger villages or tribes, and or forced by the U.S. federal government to move west beyond the Mississippi River with larger tribes. 
Since then, other tribal peoples have moved here in diaspora, including Lumbee peoples. On January 9th, 2012, two tribes of Piscataway, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe and the Piscataway Indian Nation, became the first tribes recognized by the state of Maryland. In 2017, the state also recognized the Akahanic Indian tribe. We acknowledge that the peel stands on stolen lands. We would like to also acknowledge that this history was adapted from an original text authored by Ryan A. Coons, Peter Dayton, and Ashley Minner of the Lumbee tribe, and offer our thanks for the use of this text. I also want to thank the staff of the Peel who work tirelessly every day to help Baltimore share its unique stories with the citizens of this city and with the world. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Baltimore's very own Jean Baker. Along with serving on the Peel's Board of Directors, Jean is a professor of history at Goucher College. She is the author of several books, including The Stevensons, Mary Todd Linker, Lincoln, Margaret Sanger and Sisters, The Lives of American Suffragists, as well as the book she will be discussing today, Building America, The Life of Benjamin Henry Latrobe. I hope you enjoy the show. I can't imagine a better place and a better sponsor than the Peel to talk about Benjamin Henry Latrobe, architect and engineer of the early Republic. Latrobe was a great friend of the Peels. The Peels painted excellent portraits of him uh, Latrobe and Peel exchanged uh, very amusing letters about a writing, a polygraph that they set up. Not something to take, tell whether you were lying or not, but this was a simple solution to keeping your letters, that you would have two pens and you write on one and you attach it to another pen and it writes and keeps the letters for you. Consequently, we have 9,000 Latrobe letters. But anyway, the connection between uh, the Peels and Latrobe is uh, sufficiently interesting because Latrobe was giving Peel advice about his intimate affairs all during the period. When when Peel, Charles Wilson Peel decided that he would marry for the third time, Latrobe wrote him a letter and said, I've done probability studies, this is how advanced Latrobe is, and if you've had two successful marriages, this third one won't be that way. So the connection is wonderful because when we open the Peel Center in the spring, it will have a Latrobe room. And I want this afternoon to give you some sense of Latrobe, who is to some extent a neglected and very important part of our early republic. When I began this biography, I was, like all biographers, looking for some kind of key, some sort of essence of who the person was. To give you an example, Florence Nightingale used to take apart her dolls. Dolls weren't plastic then, they were made of material. And then she would sew them back together in a harbinger of her future career. I had a hard time finding the key to Latrobe until he came to Washington in 1803 and began working on the major buildings of our early republic. And the key to Latrobe, as it emerged in my mind, was that he was every much a part of being a founder of the early republic as Madison and Jay and all the names that we hear about, he created these important buildings that became a source of 
enlightenment for Americans who in 1783 had no common heritage, no common history, no common symbols. And the buildings that Latrobe created, it seems to me, became a pivotal part of why the early republic was successful and why the United States became a united with the emphasis on united rather than states and the emphasis on states. So let me begin and try to make my case. This is Full Neck. This is where Latrobe was born in 1764. It still exists. It's still a school. But at the time that Latrobe was there during his childhood, parental contact was almost prevented. So Latrobe never knew his parents until he was 17. His father, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, was a leader in the Moravian Church as was his mother, who was American-born, but who had emigrated to England. The idea of the Moravians was, if you were going to be truly a spiritual person, there should be no interference by parents. If you were going to have an emotional connection with Jesus, and this, by the way, the Moravians are a very Jesus-centric religion, you would have to remove the parents and substitute some sort of religiosity or spiritual training. And so Latrobe lived in dormitories. These were dormitories. He was in the infants, and then you move into the small children. And the people taking care of you and raising you are surrogates. When he was 12, it was decided that he would go for further training his father hoped that he would become a Moravian minister, and he was sent to the Pedagogia in Germany, in the eastern part of Germany, near the Polish border. But Latrobe misbehaved. <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly what he did. We can imagine. He was sent to another. His father intervened, and he was sent to another such a school, and again he misbehaved. The bishop interviewed him and de decided that he, he was <clears throat> a seducer. There is no sexual connotation there. It, obviously, Latrobe is simply a mischievous bad boy who doesn't want to be a part of the church. He's expelled. His father is humiliated. In 1783, which those of you who know your American history will remember is the date of the Treaty of Paris, Latrobe arrives in London. And what you see now is the Carl von Breda portrait of him. He, he looks like sort of a dandy, doesn't he? And so while I had originally thought the key to Latrobe's personality is going to be he's a rebel, this guy doesn't look like a rebel at all. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the heck is going on with his hair. And historians believe that there is a history of everything. And I discovered a wonderful article on hairstyles in Georgian England. And this is what Latrobe is perfecting. He was having a great time in London after having been sheltered in these Moravian schools. He loved the coffee houses. He went to musicals. But he also figured out what he was going to do with the rest of his life. And that was to be an architect. And hence you see the books that he has in front of him. Do note the eyeglasses. He's nearsighted. And you will find that the glasses become more and more important to him as he gets blinder and, and blinder. 
In any case, London's important. He lived there for 13 years. He studied architecture. He also studied engineering under Sir John Soane, who was the great name in English engineering at the time. And he also married. Latrobe is one of the most luxurious men that I have ever encountered in my research. He adores his wife. They have two children, and they lived on Grafton Street. You can still go to Grafton Street in London and see their house. One day, a squire, and maybe we can see the next slide, arrived and was interested in building a villa in southeast England. And this is the house that Latrobe created. It's got some classic Latrobian features. It's simple. It's elegant. It's segmented. And you see the three separate uh, horizontals and verticals. You see the, res the recessed Palladian windows. But what makes the house exceptional is, of course, that portico. And Latrobe, in all of his designs, is able to have simple geometries, spatial geometries, and yet add a feature to them that makes them exceptional. Despite the fact that he has other commissions and he does some engineering work, in 1795 his name appears on a list of bankrupts in London. He has signed too many of his friends' debts. He has used expensive materials that some of his clients don't approve of. And therefore, he owes more money than he has. That same year of 1795, his beloved wife dies and a third child dies in childbirth. So it is time to leave London, the place he writes that I have loved so much, but am so miserable in now. And if we could see the next slide. He comes to the United States. Uh, this is one of Latrobe's watercolors. He always disparaged his watercolor technique, but in fact, he is an excellent watercolorist, and the Maryland Center for History and Culture, so much easier when it was just the Maryland Historical Society, uh, they have most of his watercolors. Here we are, he's on the Eliza, on his way across the Atlantic, the Eliza took two weeks to get out of the English Channel and another four months to get across the Atlantic because the incompetent captain, and Latrobe keeps writing about how terrible the captain is in, in the journal that he keeps, the captain didn't go south enough to get the trade winds across to the United States. But in the spring of 1796, he arrives in Norfolk. He soon moves to Richmond. And surprisingly, four months after he arrives in the United States, he's having dinner and spending the night with George Washington, whom he admired a great deal. He once wrote, Latrobe wrote of uh, Washington, uh, he has power but he has no ambition for it. A slogan that we might pass on to, dare I say it, our Republican friends. He also thought that Mount Vernon was no more than an English clerk's home. But of course, he realized that that was the point of the Republic. Americans fought a revolution against royalty and they certainly didn't want uh, their president to be living in too fancy a house. There was not enough business in Virginia for Latrobe. He did do that great American institution, a penitentiary, but he moves to 
Philadelphia in, at the end of the century. And at the time, this is before Philadelphia, the capital of the United States, moves to Washington as it does in 1800. So he moves to Philadelphia and he does this grand building, the Bank of Pennsylvania. This is classic, classic neoclassical design that you see in this building. And if you look at it, it stands out. First of all, it's marble. Secondly, it has the features of Greek architecture. And if you compare it to the brick and sometimes wooden buildings next to it in Philadelphia, it created for Latrobe a reputation that became nationwide. In Philadelphia, I guess we should see the next side now. Our destructive impulses, however, meant that the Bank of Pennsylvania would be demolished 30 years after uh, it was built. And here we see this dismal scene of destroying the bank for reasons that I've never been able to find out. Today, this site is a parking lot. If we could see the, the next slide. In Philadelphia, Latrobe met his and married his second wife. Uh, she was the daughter of a well-known Philadelphia family. And the couple were very much in love. They had six children. And in that harsh calculus of the 18th century, only three of them uh, lived to adulthood. Because he had a wife, now Latrobe could reconstitute his family, and he brought over his two children from London. When he was in Philadelphia, he did a number of commissions, but he also was responsible for one of the first public health improvements in the United States. Philadelphia didn't really have a, a, a water system. Latrobe was quite intrigued with the new invention of the time, and that's the steam engine. Before the steam engine, the only source of power that you had was animals and people and water. But with the steam engine came the opportunity to really improve water systems. So Latrobe worked out a waterworks, which ended up giving Philadelphians some much purer water than they had had in the past. But Philadelphia, like Richmond, like Norfolk, well, did not have enough business for him. And in 1803, he writes his friend, Thomas Jefferson, then the president of the United States, and asks him for a job. Jefferson was one of those Americans who was smart enough to appreciate Latrobe's business. So in 1803, Latro moves to Washington and he begins working on the critical public buildings of the New Republic. He never thought much of the White House. And I'm sure none of us do. Architecturally, it's, it's bland and boring, but Latrobe did improve it. It's Latrobe's idea to have that portico, which is really the only interesting thing in the White House, and the back bow, the, the two-story back bow that looks out uh, to the south. He once said that the problem with the White House in the, in, in the interior was that it was all stomach. We no longer can appreciate these buildings in the way that early Americans could because of security and whatever. But those of you who've been in the White House know that there's this just, just giant hall where nothing goes on. Just sit there, the Marines are there and whatever. 
But the building that Latrobe really focused on when he was in Washington as the survey or public buildings was, of course, the U.S. Capitol. And if we could see, there it is in the way that Latrobe imagined it. See the low saucer. Latrobe likes low saucers because of the lighting. See also the portico, and as well, the symmetry of the Senate and, and the House. The US Capitol is a multi-authored building. No single person can, can take credit or regret for it. But certainly Latrobe had the most, I think, important hand in keeping it to a neoclassical design. I think, by the way, that he would hate that huge dome that we have now. If we could see the next slide. This is the House of Representatives meeting room that Latrobe created in his time in Washington in 18456. It's terrific. I think everyone would agree. It was too terrific for some of the congressmen. They complained, and there is this strain of frugality in these early representatives. They complained that this was too fancy. And Latrobe responded that you could make laws in a wigwam if you wanted to, but that if you were going to try to have a great republic, you needed public buildings to inspire. Representatives also complained that they couldn't hear. Well, of course they couldn't see the dimensions of, of the building, of the, this particular room, and the trove responded that they weren't very good speeches anyway. <laughs> so here, here began this conflict uh, between uh, the Congress and Latrobe, which festered for a period of time. I don't know whether you can see, there's an eagle. Can you see the eagle next to Columbia? In any case, there is an e there is an Eagle by, the, by uh, Columbia, the female symbol of the United States. And there is a story that involves the Peels. Latrobe had imported two Italian stone carvers because there wasn't anyone that was competent in the United States. And they had begun working on a clay version of the American Eagle. Latrobe soon discovered that the eagle that they were sculpting looked nothing like American eagles. So he wrote his friend, Charles Wilson Peel. Charles Wilson Peel sends him the actual head of an American eagle. I suppose it was embalmed. And then asked that it be returned to his collection. And so the Eagle could not, no Western members of Congress could complain about an Italianate Eagle. The difficulties between Latrobe and Congress became m more and more bitter. And by 1811, Congress has cut off Latrobe's money. He's no longer the surveyor. And he needs to do something else. Again, this is the, the pattern that we find in his life, that even as he is building America, he is unable to support himself. He goes west. West in those days was Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, he begins part, he puts on his engineer's hat, and he decides, 
in conjunction with Robert Fulton, that he will make a steam boat, a steam engine driven boat uh, that will go down the Ohio River, then down the Mississippi to New Orleans. But as is often the case with Latrobe, he is overly ambitious. He names his steamboat, wonderfully I think, the Buffalo. The Buffalo was way over budget and Robert Fulton, for all his genius of innovation, was a good businessman. Fulton became more and more aggrieved that Latrobe was spending too much money, he wasn't sending the proper invoices, and again, there is a conflict. Latrobe loses control of the buffalo, and in the summer of 1814, Latrobe and his family are living in Buffalo. They, I mean, excuse me, Pittsburgh. They are selling their furniture because they have no other funds. That is the same time that the British forces are moving onto Washington, coming, coming up into Washington from Benedict, Maryland, burning the Capitol. The Latrobe family always said uh, that the British soldiers said there was only one building in Washington that was worth burning, and that was the U.S. Capitol. In any case, they took anything of, that was wood and fired Congreve rockets at it. And then if we can see the next slide, the Capitol was in ruins. The interior burned, but Latrobe is pleased because he is invited to come back to redo the Capitol. And when he comes back, he's pleased that the stone that he has insisted on, rather than the cheaper wood and brick, which some congressman wanted, has survived. And he begins redoing the Capitol. You see here the building <clears throat> with some scars. And you see also that the famous rotunda is not finished. Latrobe set about the business of redoing the Capitol. He had listened to these congressmen who said that they couldn't hear. He changes the structure of the meeting rooms into hemicycles. And he also has discovered a marvelous form of stone. It's called brescia. And it existed along the Potomac River. Some people call it pudding stone. You will see this if you watch the news and you see the interior of the Senate and House today. Both those rooms have, have columns of brescia. Again, as he's working on the redoing the Capitol, He's having trouble with this new system. There was a commissioner who was in charge of the buildings and regrettably, <clears throat> Latrobe and this particular commissioner uh, argued, fought, and finally Latrobe has to resign. Now, if we could see the next slide. This is, Latrobe in this period, this is by Rembrandt Peel, the son of Charles Wilson Peel. Do note the, the eyeglasses now have come down from the head and they are now, uh, he needs to wear them all the time. Latrobe again has to find another place to go. And, but before he's able to leave Washington, he declares bankruptcy. His debtors have been after him for years. He is in debt for many, many promissory notes, but particularly now uh, the cost of the buffalo. He simply went ahead when he was involved with projects, no matter whether it was a buffalo or whether it was a building. 
And consequently, he declares bankruptcy. And in those days, if no one covered a, a bond for you, you had to go to jail. But you didn't go to jail in the daytime. You just went at night. So at night, for several weeks, Latrobe is incarcerated. He goes through the humiliation of <clears throat> having to give up his horse, his books. He fights about the books and wins this in court. He argues that the books, architectural books, are as much tools of his trade as any mechanic's tools. He comes after his incarceration to Baltimore. And now if we can see the... This is the wonderful digital recreation of Baltimore, which I hope all of you have seen. It's at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. This is the way Baltimore looked when Latrobe arrives. It's a period in Baltimore history of great optimism about the city's future. Baltimoreans expected that they would eventually overtake Boston and they would be the third largest city in the United States. Latrobe was working on two of the most important buildings in the city. And if we could see the, there it is. There's the Basilica. Now, I, I include this slide because I think it shows, first of all, the quality of Latrobe's drawings. In this period in the United States, with few exceptions, no one was paying much attention to building great buildings that would be respected. And Latrobe's cross-section of the Basilica shows us the marvel of this particular building in our city's history. I don't know whether you've been to it recently, but it's been restored. I'm no fan of the Catholic Church, but this building deserves all the credit that we could possibly give to it. Note the, <clears throat> the low cover, the dual cover over the front part of the basilica. Note as well the vaulted masonry. The interior of the basilica does not have a lot of piers and columns that are necessary in other churches because Latrobe has figured out a way to use the bottom of the piers in the bottom of the uh, basilica rather than in the church itself. To sit in this building on a cloudy day and watch through the skylights, the light illuminating and then changing and then becoming shadowy is a utter delight and a privilege, I think, for all Baltimoreans. I only wish that we could have some kind of a square, as the Europeans have figured out, that you have a great building, you have a great cathedral, and you have a square so you can see it, as in Milan, uh, as in Venice. But today, the Basilica, uh, we're, as we drive downtown, we hardly notice it. We're looking, where are we going to park? And there's the library over there, and there are all these buildings around it. And uh, I think it's just too bad that we ha had not had better planning so that we could appreciate this great uh, structure. So the other building that uh, Latrobe is working on is one that you may not be as familiar with, and this is the Merchants' Exchange. Merchants were the economic engine of Baltimore during this period, and it was decided by a group of, of merchants that they would build a structure, a building that would be would have a lot of the things that they needed. Uh, they needed to talk to each other, so they needed a central place. Uh, they needed insurance 
firms so that they could insure their ships. They needed a bank and they needed a post office. They needed a customs office. And so Latrobe designs and builds this huge structure. For those of you from Baltimore, you will know exactly where it was when I say it was on what was then called Water Street, which is Lombard Street now, but probably will go back to being Water Street again, and Gay Street. Do notice that the huge size of this building, and that I think was the reason why it did not survive past 1910, I think it was destroyed, uh, torn down. After a period of time in Baltimore, Latrobe didn't have enough commissions, the story of his life, even as he's building these important structures. And in the last chapter of his life, he moves to New Orleans. He had signed a contract with the city of New Orleans to build another water system, just as he had done in Philadelphia. And so he moves to New Orleans. Again, n n note the number of places that this man has worked and the influence that he has been able to have throughout the United States. He moves to New Orleans. He begins working on the steam engines that are going to pump the water from Lake Pontchartrain into the homes in New Orleans. It's the season of yellow fever. All Americans during this period were well aware of yellow fever. They had no idea that the vector was a mosquito, uh, but they nonetheless knew that there were outbreaks of yellow fever in seaport cities. Latrobe, in his inimitable way, he writes in his journal the story of some of the people that he knows in New Orleans that have been dying of yellow fever. He, of course, is working in the most dangerous of circumstances. He's out in the water and he, tragically he develops yellow fever and dies in 1820 of yellow fever. He left his beloved wife and his children penniless. One of his legacies in terms of Baltimore is that they moved to Baltimore and his children were active in the B&O Railroad. His grandson, Ferdinand, was a seven-time Baltimore mayor. So, finally, Adley Stevenson said, you should always say finally to give your audience some hope. <laughs> finally, when I think of Benjamin Latrobe, I think of a man who was indeed a founding father, not of political philosophy, but of the buildings that inspired Americans and that brought them together as the United States. Fini. Thank you, Jean, for that inspired and inspiring and enlightening presentation. Folks, we are now thrilled to be joined by uh, Jean Baker from her home, and I'll bring her in now, as well as by uh, Nancy Proctor, the Peel's Chief Strategy Officer, as well as William Chick Chickering, the President of the Board of Directors at the Peel, who are joining us today from the Latrobe Room down at the Peel in downtown Baltimore. Thank you all so much for joining us. As a reminder to our viewers watching us uh, on the Peel's website, if you have any questions you would like to pass along to Jean, uh, please type those into the chat box now and we will pass them along. And I know that Nancy and Chick have some comments and questions as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jean. 
It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. And uh, one question that has been burning for me is, we do see the name Latrobe all around Baltimore. And I just wanted to know, if, is that because of his important impact on Baltimore architecture, or is there some other connection? I'm not sure I heard everything, what you're asking about the Latrobe buildings that are named around Baltimore. That's right. They, they are not Benjamin Henry's. They are the work either of his son or their name for the grandson. There was a time in the 1870s when the Ferdinand was the mayor that it became a, a, a very popular, but uh, I must say, uh, also important thing if you wanted to get city monies or whatever, that you would name your building after Latrobe. But that was not Benjamin. That, of course, was Ferdinand. So the buildings that we have in Baltimore that are still there are, first of all, the Basilica. And secondly, on the BMA, there is a reconstruction of a dairy, what he called a dairy on the southwest corner. Go and see it sometime. It's a lovely little classical building that presumably lots of cows enjoyed <laughs> as well as modern Baltimoreans. I would like to hear a little more about Andre and Frizzoni and why they have a relationship to us here in Baltimore. And I'll repeat the question for you in case uh, you couldn't hear it. It's a little quiet coming from your end. Uh, but Chick's question was about Andre and Franzoni. We know you mentioned the two Italian sculptors who worked with Latrobe uh, on the Capitol, um, but they also have connections here in Baltimore. And so Chick was wondering if you could expound upon that a little bit. Yes. Latrobe was always to get the best. And there were no good stone sculptors he believed in the united states so what do you do he casts about and sends to italy and brings over these two italians who work on the capital when the building was either the financing stopped or whatever they would come to baltimore and so what happened over time was that baltimore and also, I believe Philadelphia has some of their stone sculpture work. It is a amazing thing to me that Latrobe would have been so meticulous as to import Italian sculptors. And then when they went back to Italy, uh, and Latrobe is working on rebuilding the capital after the, the destruction in 1814. What does he do? He sends some Americans over to study with them and then brings them back over here. It's an amazing part of what historians like to call the transatlantic exchange. I loved the, uh, I'll just come a little bit closer in the hopes you can hear me better. And David, please do chime in if there are questions from the audience because Chick and I could talk to Jean about this all day and we don't want to monopolize her, her attention. But um, I love the story about the, uh, the eagle that Charles Wilson Peel provided as a model for Andre and Franzoni. And it yes. reminded me that Rubens Peel, his son, who took over running the museum around 1820-22, uh, was the one who introduced live animals as part of what you could see when you came to the Peel Museum. And they were, in fact, kept in the room immediately below the Latrobe room. And I believe there was an eagle um, as part of that collection which unfortunately one day uh, slipped its tether and flew past the tiger that was in the same room, and that was the end of the eagle. <laughs> it's maybe apocryphal, but it's a great story. And you know, we love no, stories at the field. <laughs> another, important, another important connection is that one of the uh, 
architectural pediment sculpted by Andre and Franzoni is uh, currently on display at the Peel Garden. It was originally installed on uh, First Union Bank in Baltimore. And when the renovations were being completed uh, at the Peel in uh, the early 1930s, uh, you see this pediment here that was brought over from First Union Bank that was being torn down and is still one of our uh, prime uh, objects on display in our garden. And what you're seeing here is we've got to partner with uh, our good friends over at Direct Dimensions who came and did a 3D scan of Andre and Franzoni's uh, sculptural piece and pediment that's on display at the garden. And uh, if anybody is interested uh, in exploring uh, that, uh, you can uh, either check us out at the garden or you can um, visit us online at thepeelcenter.org backslash garden. We'll definitely have to offer another tour and talk um, of the garden and dig more into that, that really important pedimental sculpture in the garden. And there's several other beautiful pieces in the garden as well. I know you're particularly proud of the sculpture garden, so to speak, that we have at the Peel. I'm interested in the Peel sculpture garden because it predates other efforts in this country, which are somewhat more famous, to bring architectural sculpture to those people who visit city museums. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum Sculpture Garden only began in the mid 60s, and here the Peel Sculpture Garden began in the 1930s. Uh, another first for the Peel. <laughs> yes. Well, we'd like to take a moment to reach out and talk about one of the needs that the Peel has at the moment. The Latrobe Room is getting a beautiful refurbishment and will be equipped to do all kinds of things that involve the Peel's mission. Um, we need to light the room properly to do so. Once upon a time, this room exhibited things like the Star Spangled Banner, many portraits of the American heroes and founding fathers, uh, and most likely some of the monumental paintings that Rembrandt Peel did, like the Court of Death. Well, in order for our audiences here to appreciate the activities which will be going on uh, in the future, in addition to the light from the skylight, we need to provide lighting instruments for the eight tracks and 16 circuits which will be available in this room to create varied lighting effects. And I wonder, um, do we have time to show people around the Latrobe room here live, David? Um, sure, it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in through the chat. So we've got okay. about uh, four or five minutes here. If you wanna take us around the Latrobe room, that would be great. Yes, and uh, I will apologize in advance if at some point the camera flips suddenly. We're trying, we are, um, Chick and I are not particularly expert with selfie sticks. <laughs> <laughs> you think we should well, around? I think what we really want to do is show you the room. Well, that's not going to work. Uh, I'm going to yeah. do that there we go. and pull it back. So what you're seeing here is a really rather gorgeous architectural pediment and doorway. It was added by Robert, uh, by John Scarf in 1930 in his rehabilitation, as he called it, a, a refurbishment of the building. He didn't call it a restoration because this would not have originally been here, but it's been here so long that it in itself is an important historical uh, characteristic of this unusual and really very spectacular room. In addition, you will see at the top the cornice work, which was installed at the same time. It has held up remarkably well as it is all plaster at the top and something called lincrusta at the bottom. This room has been lots of different colors over its history. It currently mostly looks very white like an art gallery, but at some point it was this deep rust color. It has also been cadmium yellow and several shades of dark turquoise. 
So up here at the uh, top, I guess you can get a bit of a view of the restorations that are happening, including to the uh, site there. All around the edge is where the new lighting needs to go. And uh, unfortunately, really professional lighting, quality that Baltimore storytellers and artists and performers deserve, doesn't come cheap. So we're going to need to raise about $20,000 for these lights, which cost about $550 a piece. And uh, then we can really show off the artists and the performers and the artworks of Baltimore to their greatest ability. So if you're able to help us out, um, either by buying a light for us or contributing to the purchase of a light, we would really appreciate your help. And uh, we're uh, offering a signed copy of Dr. Baker's book on Latrobe for everybody who buys a light and contributes it uh, to the Latrobe room. So please go to uh, the peelcenter.org slash campaign where you can find a little bit more uh, information and also get in touch with us if, you, if you're in a position to help us out. Thank you so much to everybody who has contributed so far and in particular to Chick and to Mike Ankrum. Our family has had so many wonderful, enjoyable experiences here at the field. We really wanted to help make the changes that are happening increasingly meaningful. So we are offering a matching grant. Our gift is $5,000 uh, to be matched by anyone who contributes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gene, I want to turn it back over to you if you are interested in, um, if you have any last comments you want to share about Latrobe or the Peel or the Latrobe room, I toss the uh, mic over to you now. Uh, it's a wonderful Baltimore connection. And I really didn't realize at the beginning of my association with the Peel exactly how tight their friendship between the Peels and the Trobe was. Uh, they represent some of the most important early Americans. Sometimes we forget them as we're overwhelmed by the political story of the founding of the United States. But as I said in my introduction, uh, these are founders, as, and particularly Latrobe with his architecture. As Winston Churchill said, we'll give him the last word, we build buildings and then they shape us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that closing note and for joining us, Gene. If you want to stick around for just a moment, um, I will close things out and then come and say goodbye to all of you. Uh, I want to um, thank Jean uh, for her incredible knowledge and enthusiasm, as well as her ongoing support of the Peel. And thank you, uh, Nancy and Chick, for joining us for the Q&A live from the Latrobe Room down at the Peel. We would like to invite you all to mark your calendars for our next virtual event, which will take place on December 7th, when we host a community update and discussion in conjunction with the Guardian's exhibition, which is currently on display at Carroll Mansion through December 19th. If you wish to visit the Guardian's exhibition, the Carroll Mansion is open on Saturdays and Sundays from noon to four, and we would love to have you check out these incredible photographs and stories. And as always, you can stay on top of the Peel's offerings on the Peel's website at www.thepeelcenter.org, as well as by signing up for our newsletter, which should be on your screen now. From everyone at the Peel, we want to thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you have a safe and joyous rest of the weekend and holiday season. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.